Well, hello, and uh, we welcome to the, this Presbyterian Association of Musicians Town Hall. I'm David Gambrell, Associate for Worship in the Presbyterian Church USA Office of Theology and Worship here in Louisville, Kentucky. This uh, town hall meeting is a collaboration between the Office of Theology and Worship and our good colleagues and friends in the Presbyterian Association of Musicians. And it's my uh, pleasure to host today, and it's my honor to introduce you to um, Dr. Martha Moore Kish, J.B. Green Professor of Theology at Columbia Theological Seminary. Martha is our featured speaker for today. At uh, Columbia Seminary, uh, Dr. Moore Kish teaches and researches Reformed theology, liturgical theology, and feminist theology. She's also engaged in work uh, around ecumenical and interfaith issues, including Reformed Catholic dialogue, Christian-Jewish relations, and the religions of India. Among um, Martha's many publications, books, articles, edited collections, she is especially excited about a, an upcoming work, the T&T Clark Handbook on Sacraments and Sacramentality. That's due to come out at the end of this year, 2022, and it will include almost 40 essays by senior and emerging scholars um, with particular attention to new and constructive themes in sacramental theology. So she's excited about that. I'm excited about that too. Of course, last but uh, certainly not least, Martha is well known and well loved to members of the Presbyterian Association of Musicians as an outstanding teacher and worship leader at the annual Montreat Worship and Music Conference. And so in that sense, um, to many of you, I'm sure she needs no introduction, but welcome, welcome, Martha. We're so glad to um, have this event with you today. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. Thank you. We, um, here's what will happen. Uh, I'll give um, Martha a chance to describe and, and briefly summarize uh, an article that she recently wrote for the reconciliation issue of Call to Worship, uh, an article titled Confessing Church, Why Do We Keep Doing These Prayers of Confession? After um, Martha has a chance to tell you a little bit about that article, I'll um, ask some questions and start some conversation. And we hope then at that point, you will join the conversation. And there are two ways that you can do that. You can um, submit a question through the Q&A feature, or you can um, ask a question or make a comment in the chat. And we will do our best to monitor both of those and um, keep the conversation going. So again, welcome, Martha. And um, tell us about that article. Well, thank you. And um, I'm sure most of you uh, who are listening in on this webinar recognize that David Gambrell, who is the host for today, could talk um, as eloquently and more eloquently than I about these matters. So it's it's an honor to be in the conversation, and I may turn it around at some point and ask you a question or two myself, if that's okay. Fair um, enough. This, uh, so this article that, uh, that I wrote um, that's in Call to Worship was um, invited, of course, for this issue, but um, as I was thinking about it, I was reflecting on particularly a couple of things that have happened in the past few years here at Columbia Seminary um, around prayers of confession. One is that I've noticed with increasing regularity that um, our Presbyterian students as we become an increasingly more ecumenical student body and faculty um, collegium, our students who are Presbyterian regularly note that the prayer of confession and the declaration of forgiveness in the worship service is the most important thing for them regularly. Um, and so I note that, and, and that, that seems to be increasingly, I think as people are increasingly aware um, of uh, the diversity of our community, they're aware that this is not something every single um, worshiping community necessarily does on a regular basis. And so our Presbyterian students tend to say that's really important for some reason. At the same time, um, I've had conversation with some of my colleagues uh, who have pointed out, you know, it's, it's all very well that we do this regularly, but it doesn't seem to always make any difference. It doesn't necessarily seem to change us. And, you know, so what are we doing? 
when we engage in these prayers of confession if they don't actually change us. So with both of those things in mind, right, I came to this um, reflection that's in call to worship and um, to try to answer that question, at least in a preliminary way, you know, why do we keep doing these prayers of confession? What difference do they make? Why are they important? And how can we be um, more mindful about how we do them in such a way that they might genuinely make a difference um, in the way that we live um, in the world? So, so in the article, I talk a little bit about a framework that I use um, when I teach on um, theological anthropology when I talk about what it means to be human um, in our theology classes, and this is a familiar framework, um, I'm sure that I'm, I'm, I'm betting that when you were Austin, David, you had something similar, right? That that when we talk about what it means to be human, it's important that we recognize that to be human is a complex reality. We can't just say one thing. We need to say several things all at the same time. Among them, we need to say at least these four things. We are created good and in God's image, we are therefore beloved by God. And secondly, we are messed up, distorted, infected, pick your metaphor, uh, by sin, um, that, we, that we get it wrong. In spite of our goodness, we get it wrong too much of the time. Thirdly, that we are forgiven, redeemed by God. And fourthly, that we live in hope of a final reality, a final day when all will be restored and made well. All of these four things are true all the time. And so when we come then to the confession of sin, it's important to recognize that, that this is a confession of one aspect of our truth about who we are, but it's not the only thing. And it's not the first thing or the last thing that we should say. Um, uh, as I often say, uh, sin, it's important to say, sin is framed by grace. Grace precedes and follows our confession of sin. And so um, one of the things we need to bear in mind is that it is, not it is not the only thing we say about our reality, but it's an important thing that we say because it tells the truth about the way that we fail um, to love one another. We fail to love God. We fail to care and love for this world that God has um, entrusted to our care. So uh, we need to tell the truth about that in order to reckon with it and to try to receive God's grace so that we might um, live differently. So um, that's this way I sort of set up. Um, and then, and then uh, I've, I've talked in the article about um, how sin is a kind of truth telling. I talked some about my own experience in the past um, year and a half of confronting the sin of racism in a really painful and um, important way in my own life um, in the classroom at Columbia Seminary um, and about how even in that context, I came to recognize that confrontation with shame, with the deep experience of shame can actually be understood as transformative if we recognize it as a deep uh, confrontation with our own sinfulness in a way that doesn't paralyze us, but that does open us to transformation. Um, and then I've got some cautions about how I think we, get, we need to be careful about uh, how it is that we confess our sin. Um, and finally, again, how it is that, that confession is both uh, preceded by and followed by grace. And so I think handled rightly, confession of sin can be genuinely an opening to grace um, and not an opportunity to wallow in despair or shame. So I think that's what I'll say, maybe by way of beginning. Is that enough for now? Wonderful. Thank you, Martha. I, um, I do have some questions, and I, I hope that our, um, our participants are also thinking of some questions to, to ask Martha. Um, but first, let me ask you to elaborate on that way in which uh, confession is framed by grace. Could you tell me what that looks like in a, a service of worship? Yeah, sure. Uh, recognizing that there might be a variety of ways to do it, I do think one of the things um, that's important to think about when we uh, lead into a prayer of confession is how what we say. And um, one way or another, I think it's important to not to say, if we confess, then, right? Not to say, if we just get the words right, if we just get the contrition right, right? If we just say, it, I'm sorry enough times, then God will forgive us, right? That would be a trap that Martin Luther uh, would never uh, forgive us for. Well, anyway, um, that, that 
it's the logic of the prayer of confession is not if then, but because therefore. That is to say, it's not if we confess, then God will forgive us, but because God has already offered us forgiveness, therefore we are free to confess our sin. So one way to do that in um, the Book of Common Worship, uh, one of the um, uh, calls to confession is um, the quote um, from Paul, I think it is, who says, you know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Actually, I might even have this uh, in a PowerPoint slide. David, do you think? Would this I be would a time? Glad to share that. Yes. You want to? Okay. If you want to bring that up, we might be able to find that in that page. Um, let's see. Can you all see there it that? Is. Yes, yes, yes. I'm looking. I'm thinking about that second one. Yes, it's the Romans five eight text that I was thinking about. So it's that. It's that second um, call to confession there. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. And then it's followed there by the Hebrews. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. But I think that that encapsulates um, so well the importance of the ordering, right? That it's, it's not that we have to confess and then God forgives, but that because God is forgiven, therefore. So that's one thing I would say um, that's important to think about. And then, and then another thing to think about is um, following the prayer of confession to offer some kind of an assurance of forgiveness or a declaration of forgiveness. Like, for example, here you go, right here, are a couple of examples. Um, the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. I actually, it's, I like the um, pronouns there. Um, and I notice um, I'm speaking here, of course, to one of the editors of the Book of Common Worship. So David, I, I know that you probably had uh, conversations about this. Do you Many want to comment on that? <laughs> comment on the I and the we. Yeah. Um, so there, there was a quote actually toward the end of your article, um, uh, a quotation from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, <laughs> about how important it is that we hear these words of th these assurances of forgiveness from another person. Um, mm -hmm. I can tell myself that I'm forgiven. I need, to, I need to receive that good news from another person. I need to hear it from another person. And, and so that's why the, the first part uh, is so important, the I declare to you part. This is a, a declaration that comes to us from another person in the body of Christ. But um, there is also a, a mutuality. We uh, are not saying that there is, a, you know, one leader who is sinless and is uh, pouring out the, yeah. the grace upon all the sinners. Um, it's a, we're, we're mutually confessing and we're mutually forgiven. And so that's why the, the, the pronoun we is so important. Yeah, thank you for I noticing. love that. I love that that juxtaposition is there. I'll just read that little quote you alluded to from Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, folks may want to look you. this up. This is from um, Life Together. And the quote is this. He's talking about um, the importance of mutual confession. And he says, it is grace that we can confess our sins to one another. Such grace spares us from the terrors of the last judgment. The other Christian has been given to me so that I may be assured even here and now of the reality of God in judgment and in grace. As the acknowledgement of my sins to another believer frees me from the grip of self-deception, so too the promise of forgiveness becomes fully certain to me only when it is spoken by another believer as God's command and in God's name. Yeah, so I think that's the point that you're encapsulating right there. I declare to you, in not in my name, but in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of Jesus Christ, right? Yeah, every word in that that short sentence is so so important and yeah. uh, required so much thought and care. I really appreciate that. And while you've got the screen up, I'll just note the second example there is has a different um, kind of nuance, and I think it's helpful to see another way to frame this is. Um, in the passive, right? Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. So that um, I think it's helpful to vary the way that we pronounce forgiveness. Um, and, and in this case, the emphasis is not on uh, the I or the we, but right. on the you. Know that you, you singular and you plural all, 
have received God's forgiveness. I think the implication there, of course, is God is the one who does the forgiving. But um, right. yeah. And this is something we can we can know and, and trust and, yeah. and from which we, we derive such peace. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and yeah. I, I, you make the point in the article that um, sometimes it seems these prayers of confession become rote or feel empty. And I, I think having a variety of ways, I mean, these, these are of course yeah. just a very few examples, uh, but having a variety of ways to, to express God's grace um, helps helps the prayers remain fresh. Absolutely. And just to that point, um, not only the call to confession and the declaration of forgiveness, but the prayer of confession itself can be done in a variety of ways. And, you know, to your point, I think uh, doing it in a variety of ways helps it not to just become rote. Um, although I'll, I'll say this in, in defense of repetition, I'll say this. Um, when I was in college, I uh, went to a church that had the same prayer of confession every week. It was, a, let me just see, it was, a, I think it was probably Book of Common Prayer. Um, so I don't think it was this one, but it was, but it's, it's a very common um prayer of, comment, of, of confession that's in our book also. And I, I know it's not that one either, but in any case, I'll have to look it up. What I was thinking though, is that it, it got to the point because we did the same one every week that it did get ingrained. I didn't have to look at the words and it could travel with me, right? And, and there is something to be said for repetition in a certain way uh, where texts begin to live in you and become part of your speech. So I will say that. And also, um, it's helpful to have some variety, um, both in the words that we say together and also in the way that we do them. Um, probably all those on this call will can think of several examples of ways that they've um, experienced prayers of confession, sometimes with some silence in the middle, sometimes with embodied action. Um, for example, you know, you may have experienced opportunities to write something on a little piece of paper that you either take with you or you um, sometimes I've seen, you know, bringing pieces of paper up uh, to the front uh, in some way that they then get taken up and burned or washed or right some in some way symbolically to um, to signal the way that our sins are not held um, ultimately in God's eyes, uh, but are forgiven. So there's a variety of ways to think about embodying action at, at the prayers of confession, um, as well as allowing space for silence, allowing space perhaps even for individual spoken prayer quietly or aloud, um, as well as uh, what is common in many places, a kind of prayer of confession that people say all together. Yeah. And while we're thinking about um, embodiment and action, um, I wanted to note the rubric about lifting water from the font as we declare yes. the good news and um, sort of back at the beginning uh, pouring water uh, or leading the, the confession and pardon from the font uh, would you care to say a few words about why that connection with baptism and sacramentality is important yes uh, i'll say a few words and then perhaps you'll you'll add on um i will say i think that's a powerful action and has become increasingly common i think in the past I don't know, 10 years or so in the Presbyterian church, I see it free, with increasing frequency. Um, because I think that it, there's an ancient right connection. If we think about John the Baptist's um, call to baptism, uh, repent and be forgiven, right? Uh, so the connection of baptism with repentance, with the confession of sin and the forgiveness of sin and the turning away from sin goes all the way back to the gospels. And Jesus's own baptism was uh, itself in that tradition, right? Jesus in submitting to John's baptism was in solidarity with uh, all of those who were going into the water uh, to repent and to turn and to be forgiven. And so as we then connect the confession of sin with uh, baptism, if you think about that at the font, we make that connection ourselves, a reminder that when we come to the font, among other things, we are um, uh, telling the truth about our own sinfulness and uh, asking for God's grace to turn us again and again and again so that we can live in newness of life, right? Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. There it is. The old life is gone and a new life 
has begun that that is a baptismal declaration um, among other things, right? What else would you say, Dave? I, I couldn't, couldn't say it any better than that. Yeah, just, uh, that every time we confess and hear these words of grace, it's a chance to remember baptism and be thankful and say, thanks be to God. Right. And I guess I would add that uh, this is all connected with those um, aspects of of the human condition that you talked about as well. Those are kind of facets of um, who we are and who we're called to be in God's eyes. I am going to stop sharing the screen, I think, unless there is anything else in particular you'd like to look at. Not, not at this moment. We might come back to it. Okay. I want to encourage our participants again to um, use the Q&A feature, use the chat uh, to ask some questions. Um, Mary Boyd has asked for um, a link to the article, and uh, I see that's been provided. So um, thank you, Kelly Abraham, for that. Um, and we've got a question from, from John Sawyer. So I will um, read that now. John says, I was talking with the eighth graders in my confirmation class the other week about the difference between the personal and the corporate prayers corporate in prayers of confession. I can remember praying the prayer of confession as a young person and thinking, well, I'm not guilty of that. <laughs> but then later coming to terms with the idea that humanity writ large is very much guilty in a broad sense of that specific sin. And so John is wondering if you could say a bit more about the I versus the we um, when it comes to a good prayer of confession. Yeah, that's such a great question, John. Thank you for that. And I think that is a good thing to bear in mind. And I, I talked about that a little bit in the article. Um, just to just to look, at, just as an example, um, the the prayer that I cite at the beginning of the article. Well, actually, David, I'm sorry. We might want to go. Yeah, back. no, I'll pull it pull it right it's back up. Back up on that slide that you just had up. This is an example of a, um, a you know an ancient prayer that um, that is not terribly specific. Um, and I think what's helpful about it is I think most anybody can find themselves in this prayer somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right, merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. So already you've got a breadth of different um, things taken into account, what we think, what we say, what we do, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. I love that also, right? It's sins of, we sometimes say, omission and commission, right? It's, it's, that is to say that, that when we confess our sin, in part, we need to attend to what we particularly do. Um, but if you're going to invite people into um, a corporate prayer of confession, you need to provide enough space that they can actually find themselves and not have that reaction that John names, right? It's like, well, I haven't actually hit anybody recently, or I, ha I haven't bitten my sister, right? Or I haven't actually done that very specific thing. So we need to be careful, I think, about being overly specific um, so that people can in some way enter freely and, um, and into that prayer and find themselves there. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Well, I mean, who, who, who could avoid acknowledging that truth, right? We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Surely somewhere in there, we can all identify what that looks like. Um, so I think what's helpful about that is that it does provide a lot of space for individuals to find themselves. Um, there are, of course, other examples, I think, where, where you can be a little more specific. And here, the important thing is to know your community. That's really key, I think. Whoever is um, preparing or leading worship, knowing your community and knowing, therefore, what words will resonate um, across the diversity of the community um, is just vital. And that's going to vary depending on who you are. If you're in a community that is primarily let's say primarily a community that is privileged, then you might wanna think about confessing in a way that names that um, economic privilege and calls us to account. However, I wanna say really clearly how you have to be careful about that because I have also been in situations where maybe the majority of worshipers are people who have economic privilege, but not all. And right. so you don't wanna, 
you don't actually want to say, I don't think, you don't want to make everybody say, we have walked by those poor neighbors on the street. When, when there may be people in that worshiping body who themselves um, are unhoused, right? Who themselves um, are guests um, in, our, in our shelters, right? You want to be really careful about how specific you get, right? So, so I think a lot of sensitivity there about, about knowing your community. Now, back to John's question about the I and the we, I think, um, John, you've named that exactly right on. You wanna both be able to recognize the way that we confess, ways that we are complicit in systems of sin, and there are particular individual actions and both of those are important to be able to name in some way. Maybe not equally every week. I mean, that's also a kind of overtime thing in a community. You want to think about um, attending to both of those dimensions of sin. Um, and it may be that one week you're more attentive to one versus the other. But over time, I think you want to watch um, watch for that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is all really helpful and and relevant. I, I do think prayers of confession are some of the hardest things to, to write uh, when it comes to crafting liturgy for all of the reasons that you've uh, described. The, um, you made me think of one of the prayers in the, the latest edition of the Book of Common yeah. Worship that tries to, and who knows how successfully, uh, it's page 609. 609? Uh, yep, 609 tries to acknowledge those different experiences by saying, um, God, you are the maker of heaven and earth, yet some claim to discover the land while others are pushed aside. Oh, you are the life of the world, yet some abuse and exploit your creation while others hunger and thirst. Mm. Um, and, and it goes on like that, acknowledging um, something that you talked about in the article, actually, the suffering of the sin against, um, yes. alongside the the shame of our sin, and, yeah. And I think it's so important that we hold those things together, that we um, lament and confess at the same time. Yeah, David, thank you for drawing attention. That's a beautiful prayer on six oh nine. Um, particularly appropriate, noted here um, for Indigenous Peoples Day or Thanksgiving Day. What I love about this is that it names both sides. Um, um, and it also doesn't say where we are, right? It doesn't, right. there's no, I stand here or you stand there. It is some. And yeah. so those who are praying it are not slotted in, right. um, but, but can find themselves and perhaps different moments might find themselves on both sides. That's right, that. mm -hmm. yeah. It also, I appreciate you mentioning the context of Indigenous Peoples Sunday or Thanksgiving. Context is important, uh, as as you mentioned, the context of our uh, our, our congregational identity and mission um, that affects what we confess and how we how we confess. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. And there might even be times, and again, this needs to be handled carefully, but. Um, times when there might be an opportunity for individual allowed prayer of confession. I think this needs to be handled probably and only in a smaller community, but if you have a smaller community of people who know and trust one another, that can be a powerful opportunity for people to be able to say aloud, um, you know, what they need to confess and then to receive that forgiveness um, in the body. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I see another question uh, from, from Timothy Nolan, um, who says, a member of my congregation told me he felt he did not feel that it was appropriate to feel guilty of sin worth confessing every week. What would you say to him? And Timothy says, I myself have no problem in, <laughs> in my own life. Um, so yes, and that relates to one of the things um, that you and I have talked about. Um, People sometimes ask, is it really essential to have a confession of sin in Reformed Presbyterian worship every week? Is it, is it a valid service if the confession is not included? That's one way sometimes people ask the, the question right. to me. Um, what are we missing when we don't do it? Uh, and, and how would you respond to Timothy? Gosh, that's such a great 
a nest nest of questions. Um, so let me back up to the way you framed it there just a moment ago. Uh, is it a valid service if there's not a prayer of confession? I do get that question too. Um, and and I want to veer away from questions of validity uh, because I think that unnecessarily takes us into some kind of rules discourse, which I don't think is especially helpful. Um, mm. Right. So I think I would I would want to say. It's not about what makes valid worship, but it is about what is the prayer of confession seeking to communicate and um, invite us into, and um, and are there cases when that is uh, not necessary? And um, I think what I would say to that is ordinarily, I do think it is a vital part. There might be cases in which it's not, um, it is omitted, but I think as a general rule, the um, prayer of confession is is just a really important part of worship. Why? Well, again, back to what I said, I think, originally, which is it's part of telling the truth about who we are. It, if we're going to face the reality of who we are as human beings um, in the presence of God and one another, we need to simply tell the truth about how we harm one another. Now, you know, to um, uh, Timothy's question, did, if there's a member of the congregation who says he does not feel it's appropriate to feel guilty of sin, maybe that's unnecessarily restricting the purpose of the prayer of confession to somehow feeling guilt. It's not just about feeling guilt. It's simply about telling the truth. Right. It's just about saying, I have harmed my neighbor, um, either directly or indirectly. And that some of that is I have harmed my neighbor by participating in systems of Right. right? Um, uh, economic uh, disparity, mm -hmm. right? I live in a way that costs other people. Right. I don't do that intentionally. And I don't want to be crippled by guilt. At the same time, I need to face it. And I need to be held accountable. On a regular basis, I need to be held accountable by my community. And I need to find ways together with my community to live in a way that tries to move, you know, in whatever fragmentary way toward a life of discipleship. So that's really how I would want to frame the prayer of confession is part of this larger picture of what it is that we're trying to do as Christians to tell the truth, to confront the ways in which we participate in systems of harm and the ways in which we directly harm people, and to seek God's grace to transform us and live lives that are of, of greater faithfulness. I mean, that's, that's just, that's all it is really. Yeah. I, I think that's a wonderful and helpful pastoral response. Yeah. It's maybe not about making people feel guilty, um, right. but telling the truth and being open to God's grace. And, and that we certainly need to do that every week. Right. And just to underscore that point, you know, about not needing to feel guilty. I do think, it's important to recognize, and I um, and I want to honor, you know, depending, Timothy, on the particular congregation that you're dealing with, it is important to recognize there's real harm that can be done by sin talk, right? And there is real harm um, that can be done by particularly people who are traumatized, people who have been harmed or oppressed in various ways. We don't want to participate in, um, um, in, in, in harming people um, in ways that that uh, don't open them to God's grace. So, so if there is a member of the congregation who has been traumatized in some way, right, by sin talk, by by thinking that sin is simply about this particular prescribed list of specific individual actions, yeah. um, then it's important to back up and say, let's talk. Let's have a larger conversation about what it is that we're confessing when we're confessing sin. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this, this conversation questions around the confession of sin can be openings or opportunities for important pastoral conversations that need oh, to happen yeah. or so opportunities for Christian education and formation, uh, mm -hmm. preaching on sin and grace and absolutely right. Yeah. 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 Thank you. So Charles Freeman has, um, said in the chat, I wonder about the ob observation earlier in the discussion about being changed or not by the regular practice of confession and assurance of pardon. Can we really know this? Do we want to imagine what we would be without that regular reminder? 
of both our fallenness and God's grace. I don't know if this is something that needs to be discussed or not, uh, but it's what came to my head, Charles says. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And of course, um, we don't always know. Um, but sometimes we do. And, and I, one of the stories that I've included in the article to that point is one that uh, was shared with me many years ago by a pastor friend of mine who um, was the pastor of a church and one of the members of the congregation came to him um, and said, uh, basically the story was that this member of the congregation had um, gotten into terrible um, debt um, through mismanagement of his own funds and had, had maxed out all his own credit cards, had bankrupted himself and his wife, and had then, without his daughters knowing it, had taken his daughter's credit card and had, uh, had run his daughter into debt and bankrupted her. Um, and he was so ashamed and crippled by the guilt of what he had done that he began to contemplate um, suicide. And, uh, and I, I, I'm just sharing this because that, this is the way the story was told to me. And, and at the same time, this congregation member shared with my friend that it was because of continuing to come to church continuing to confess sin with the body of believers and receive confession, receive forgiveness week after week. He, his experience was that it had literally saved his life. Yes. And so, I mean, that's just, I, I can't, right. I can't um, forget that story. Uh, it's a yeah. powerful story. Yeah. This is on the top of page four in Martha's article. If anybody wants to, to look at that and read it. Um, but yes, I, Confession can be a life-saving gift. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And again, if it's important that we understand that not as perpetuating um, shame, right? Or simply saying you're a terrible person. It's not about that. It's about the freedom that can come from acknowledging what we know to be true. Right. Right acknowledging what we know about the harm that we have done to other people and being able to say that aloud is already itself freeing. And particularly if it is then framed by God loves you anyway. Right. <laughs> right. And that's God good news. Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it makes me also think about there, there was a recent article um a, a vox that's vox with a mm. v not fox with an f um <laughs> a vox article uh called everyone wants forgiveness but no one is being forgiven and it talks about the cycle of outrage in our modern society and and the need for um public forgiveness, the need that they refer to a culture of public forgiveness. And the article talks about um, you know, how hard it is for people to, to truly apologize uh, and all the, the sort of fake apologies, half apologies that, that you get from people when there are scandals in the news. And so I wonder if um, this is a gift that the church has to share with with our society. Um, I, I think too often confession is something that we feel a little bit embarrassed about. It's one of those stodgy old churchy things, but, but what if it's really a gift? Um, con confession and pardon, something that um, the church has to offer to the world. Gosh, you know, David, that's just so beautiful. You're making me think of um, the work of um, a scholar, one of my daughter Fiona's teachers in college, um, named Loretta Ross, who talks about calling out and calling in. And so Loretta Ross uh, on the faculty of Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, um, talks about the importance of calling people in to conversation versus simply calling people out. And I think that's relevant to what you're talking about in our culture of outrage, in our culture of calling people out, naming publicly the ways in which they um, are harmful, uh, whether it's sexist or racist or whatever, 
but calling out without also offering some kind of avenue for transformation and forgiveness and grace is simply destructive, yeah. right? And, yeah. and I think that's Loretta Ross's point is, how, what if we were to think of it not as calling out by itself, but calling in to a community of conversation that is seeking, right, to do better? I think I hadn't made that connection until you were just saying that. And Thank you. And I see Kelly's put a link to that article. Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Thank you very much, Kelly, for that. It, it, it strikes me that maybe that's why it's so important that our confessions of sin are framed by these expressions of God's grace. That's the calling in. Um, mm -hmm. That's it. Yes, you should write that article. Write that article. <laughs> well, um, I want to lift up a couple of other comments. Uh, I think this is a comment from John Sawyer. I'm mindful of certain laws being passed against talking about certain uncomfortable truths in school history classes, specifically because it makes certain people feel uncomfortable. It would seem that there are times when the prayer of confession stands in the face of us feeling comfortable, but the assurance of pardon moves us toward the comfort we are so longing for. Yeah, maybe that's that calling in again. Being bathed in the reminder of God's grace week after week can be such a blessing. Indeed, John. Um, Barry, uh, my colleague Barry in San, in San George, says a classic ordering of confession of sin in the Reformed tradition is sort of a gospel sandwich. I love that. It <laughs> makes me hungry. Um, first, we hear the gospel, then we confess, then we hear the gospel again. Yep, that's exactly that being framed by grace, framed by the gospel. So Barry asks, how does this ordering enable and shape confession? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's beautiful. Thank you, Barry. And, and of course, we talked about that a little bit earlier as we were looking at those examples of the call to confession and then the assurance of pardon or the declaration of forgiveness. Um, and so the ways in which particularly, I think we were talking about the call to confession, needing to convey that because therefore logic, not the if then logic. So that's one thing I would say. But right. the question also makes me think about, um, you know, where in the service we might include a prayer of confession. Mm -hmm. um, and if we think about this lovely image of the gospel sandwich, it, it opens up the possibility that um, at least sometimes that prayer of confession might occur at other points might not only be appropriate at the beginning of worship, which is where we most commonly um, see it as the kind of um, acknowledgement of our sin and reception of forgiveness in order that we can then be opened up to hear and encounter the word of God. That's the most common place that we encounter it. But there might also be times when um, a prayer of confession might be right smack in the middle of the service, right after a, a sermon, let's say, for example, if there's a if there's a reading of scripture and a proclamation of the word that is leading people to uh, confession, it might be that a prayer of confession occurs uh, appropriately following a sermon prior to coming to the table, let's say, right, where the, at the table, then we encounter yet again, you know, the good news that while we were yet sinners, here's right. Christ at the table with sinners and tax collectors after all, right? Um, not waiting for us to get it right, um, but here already, right? So, so I could imagine different configurations of that gospel sandwich um, in, in different orders of service from time to time. Yeah. And your mentioning of the different orders of service makes me think about um, how in, in certain services in the Christian year, the confession is placed differently. So um, Psalm 51 is used as the prayer of confession in the, the Ash Wednesday service. And it does happen, I think, after the proclamation of the word, um, setting up the imposition of ashes. In the uh, Good Friday service, uh, there's the, the solemn reproaches of the cross, which right. um, is Christ's lament to the church. And that kind of takes the place of confession in that service and happens at a different time in a different way after we've heard the story of the the crucifixion. Right. And I think that's so powerful. Um, I, I experienced that really powerfully at one Good Friday. Uh, when we then leave, if we leave a Good Friday service after that, without even a declaration of forgiveness yet, 
Mm. Uh, but anticipating the, that we will be back on Easter morning, um, you know, it, it gives us a longer space to sit with that, um, that reality of the brokenness of our world um, and the brokenness of our lives. And, and there are times that we, we need to be able to face that. Yeah. Um, as long as, as long as there is that word of grace eventually, right. It's important not to suspend it indefinitely, but, but in the context, I think of a larger movement uh, over a course of a week or, or several days, or three day liturgy as the, the three day liturgy, yeah. Good Friday mm-hmm. services intended to be a part of, yeah. Exactly, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And I should say, Barry is the one who um, pointed me to that article from Vox on, on forgiveness. So thank you also, Barry, for that uh, in our conversation the other day. Um, I don't see any other um, comments or questions in the chat. Um, but I do, we have a few more minutes. I do encourage you to um, uh, offer those if you've got them. Um, I'm looking could at I my ask, list. Yeah, could go I ahead. Ask you, could I ask you a question while we're, we've got a few more minutes? Um, one of the things that, uh, of course, the Book of Common Worship mentions in the rubrics, and, and I'm sure many people have experienced, is um, the way in which music can be incorporated helpfully. Hello. You've got your guitar there. <laughs> I was hoping that's what you were going to ask. I would look really silly if I pulled out the guitar and that wasn't. What you that's know. exactly where I was going. I just wanted if you if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, examples, ways that you can recommend for effective use of of music in this kind of confession sequence. Sure. Um, so in the Glory to God hymnal, um, literally the heart of the hymnal is the confession section. If you take um, 853, the number of hymns, and divided that in half. The middle one is 427, um, wow. and that's uh, a hymn um, from Pakistan called Jesus Knows the Inmost Heart. So um, right at the heart of the hymnal is uh, are these opportunities to sing confession. So I'll just sing a couple of um, examples of some things from this section of the hymnal um, so we can maybe imagine uh, singing our confession. Jesus knows the inmost heart, nothing can be hidden. Jesus knows the inmost heart, nothing can be hidden. And it goes on to sing, this our sinful hearts require flame of God's refining fire, working in us day by day till the dross is burned away. And there are three more stanzas of that one. Um, Another lovely one, the the page right before that, um, is from Taiwan, Uh, Search Me, O God. It's based on Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, O God, and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the everlasting So there are some um, some beautiful ways to to sing our confessions. Um, a few is examples. Perdon is Perdon Senor in there somewhere? It is. Yes, that's uh, number four thirty one, and it sounds like this: Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. So this is a kind of a congregational refrain. Forgive us, Lord. And then a leader sings, for grievance and injustice, forgive us, Lord. Aloofness and indifference, forgive us, Lord. For weakness and transgression, forgive us, Lord. Resistance and rebellion, forgive us, Lord. Um, That's another beautiful 
example, and you can see that it would be easy to substitute in uh, different phrases for the leader part and, and mm -hmm. change that um, prayer of confession according yeah. to the context. And that's a great example of, um, you know, a, a sung prayer that um, most any congregation can learn that refrain. And you can do it a cappella, you can do it with guitar, you could do it with piano. Right. Um, or other instrumentation, depending on what you have available. It doesn't require a big choir, a big organ um, at all, right? Um, and as you say, it can be improvised, uh, adding other words if you wish yeah. to. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, another one that I, I really appreciate in this section is Son of God Whose Heart is Peace, a Maori hymn from New Zealand. Um, and I'll sing the second stanza this time. Take away our sinfulness, evil that imprisons us. Free us from what troubles us. Give our souls release. So um, we can sing these prayers of confession with Christians all over the world. Um, and with Christians in every time and place, um, the the notes at the bottom of the page on, let's see, which one was that? Lord Jesus, think on me, number 417, um, it notes that this text is among the oldest hymns in this book. Um, it's from Synesius of Cyrene in the fifth century, and it's, um, yeah, originally from, from Greek, uh, coming to us through a 19th century paraphrase. So, um, these sung prayers of confession are, are ancient. And of course, one of the oldest too is simply the Kyrie, right? Just the repetition of a Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, whether the Greek or the English is, uh, is another way of connecting us across centuries and across the world to that ancient, that ancient prayer. That's that right. Yep. Jeffrey McIntyre. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Yeah, go, you, no, you go. Uh, well, notes that a, a singing bell can be very uh, effective under, conf under confession. So I think that would be um, using a, a handbell and, and playing around the edge. I'm not sure. Is that a Tibetan singing bowl, I think? Is that what that oh, is? Probably. Singing bowl. Correct. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I've, I've got one in the other room, but it's a bit far to reach for right here. But yes, that's right. If you can make it sing, um, and you could have multiple of those too, it provides a kind of drone or the handbell technique. Oh, well, yes. That so too. using a handbell like a singing bowl. Yes, that's right. Oh, that's right. You can do a hand that with a hand. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that idea. And it does that kind of uh, praying with a repeated drone or, um, or a repeated refrain can be really conducive to inviting people to enter into their own meditative space, right? Um, and if you do that, I think, David, you probably know better than I do about this, but I would say, if you do that, don't rush it, right? Give people time um, to really uh, be able to settle in to that space uh, of contemplation and reckoning, right, with their own, um, with their own brokenness, right? right? Don't, don't just rush toward the forgiveness um, until they have a minute. Right. Yeah, that, that makes me think of the importance of silence in our sequences of, of confession and pardon. Um, and yeah, how it, it's not always comfortable, but it, it's another example of it being Im important uh, for us to live in that silence and sit in it. Um, and, and having a singing bell might be a way to Yep. enliven the silence so it's it's silence and yet it feels purposeful and um, feels like silence before God yeah that's a great point that's a great point enlivening the silence that's a great image for what that is yeah yeah yep. thank you well, for pulling your guitar off the wall well of course we're um coming close to the end of our time um I want to ask you, Martha, if you have any um, any closing remarks or observations. Mary says thanks for a great conversation and um, 
Michael Wachewski said thanks for theological and liturg liturgical leadership. Um, Martha and I, I know, give thanks for the leadership of all of you participating Absolutely in this right. conversation. Absolutely right. And it would be uh, it would be even a richer conversation if all of you were on the screen with us. Um, maybe I'll just end by uh, reminding us uh, of the words from the Directory for Worship, another resource for those of us who are Presbyterian in thinking about worship, which I hope all of you are using in your own um, teaching uh, and reflection in your own churches. Um, but one of the things that it says in the directory for worship is that when we come to worship, we must also face the sinful state of the world and of our lives, confessing our unworthiness to enter into God's presence. And there, again, that's just a word about um, why we do this. Um, it's, it's not to make us feel guilty. It's not to beat us up or to say that you are just worms but it is to tell the truth about the sinful state of the world note, first of all, Conf part of what we're doing is we're confessing what is simply true about this world in which we live. And within that, also of our own lives, um, so that we are never, we are not worthy to come into God's presence, but the good news is this, God is always already there. And in order for us to receive that as good news, it's important that we recognize that it is a gift, right? It's not something that we're entitled to. It's something that we receive precisely because, um, precisely because we don't deserve it. So there's the gospel. There it is. And thanks be to God. <laughs> Amen. And thanks be to God for all of you and for the opportunity for this conversation. Um, I think, um, we have one more minute, and I believe Catherine or Kelly uh, might want to jump on and uh, make some announcements, or let me give you the opportunity to do that. Hey, Catherine. Hi. Um, no announcements uh, for me. I mean, the Worship and Music Conference is coming up in June, right around the corner, so if you haven't registered for that, online, in person. We'd love to see you um, in any way that you can uh, be there. But um, thank you all for being here. And thank you, David and Martha, for this conversation. It was, it was great. It was so great. Um, a lot to reflect on, I'm sure, for many of us. So um, yes, and David will be doing the Rotley Lecture at Montreat. So um, we won't want to miss that. Definitely. Hope, to, hope so. to see you all there. Yeah. All right. Well, have a good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Blessings. <laughs>